Yes, it's recording. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. How are you? I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm John Adamus. I'm the writer next door. And this is your masterclass on query letters. Uh, for those who don't know me, hi. Um, I'm a developmental editor and writing coach. I've been doing it 22 years now. Uh, I also am now working with a variety of publishers in mostly science fiction and fantasy right now, but I've done romance and children's books and YA and picture books. And I even did some Westerns and erotica, but that's a couple of years ago. But my experience with query letters is uh, not just teaching them, but also uh, reading them. And I'm the guy who made the decisions about who gets rejection letters. So um, yeah, if some of you were mad over the last couple of years, it might be because of me and I'm sorry. But my, my goal today is to uh, help you just make querying not scary because I talk to a lot of authors and I talk to a lot of aspiring authors and prospective people who look at querying like they're gonna try to climb a mountain in flip-flops. And it doesn't have to be scary and it doesn't need to be, it's one of my favorite things. You know, I, I hate to make that terrible confession, but it's one of my favorite things in the whole world because when you do it right uh, and, you, and you get an author who's really enthusiastic, it's joyous and it's, it's easier than you think and it's okay to be happy and it's okay to be joyous about your work. So um, what I have for you today is first and foremost, I have a, a submission from somebody and I'm going to go through their query letter line by line. Hopefully uh, they won't mind jumping in the hot seat and answering some questions as I go, but I want to go line by line through their query and talk to them about what works and what doesn't. I also want to um, just kind of go over the basics of query letters, what there should be and what there shouldn't be. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, heads up, there's a little bit of a rant coming because um, I'm going to go talk about a thing that, that's in queries that's sort of popular and I sort of don't like it. And I'm not trying to persuade you not to like it, but uh, it's at least worth talking about. So um, let's do this, right? So we're going to start. I'm going to say so a lot. It's, it's a thing. If I'm not allowed to swear, we're all going to have to deal with some so's and some wells and some uhs. Cool? All right, let's go. So let's start with what a query letter is and what a query letter isn't. First and foremost, a query letter is a one-page document, about 300, maybe 325, 330 words that function as the opening part of a business relationship between you, the author, and the agent or editor or publisher you're sending a thing to. It's a marketing document. It's designed primarily to say, hey, here's this cool thing that I want you to know about, say yes to, and ideally pay me for. Uh, it is not, and I cannot stress this enough, it is not a synopsis. That's a totally different document and probably a totally different class you can take. It's not a synopsis. It is not the, the text equivalent of pressing the, uh, the info button on your TV remote and getting that little blurb and how many stars it is. Uh, it's not that either. It's, it's a one-page document with some very clear components to uh, basically make somebody say yes to reading the manuscript. That's it. It's got a few simple steps and it's short, 300 words. Total, including your address, including the person to whom you are addressing it. It does not go on and on for pages. It can be very straightforward. It can be double spaced. It can be single spaced. Loads of different people are going to do that loads of different ways. That's why we have a thing called submission guidelines. Most publishers, most agents have them. And then you ask for them or see them on their website or whatever. And then you follow them. They're guidelines, sure but they're sort of strongly enforced guidelines. We don't want to call them rules because that sounds scary. If we call them guidelines, it sounds encouraging. So follow your submission guidelines, whether it's single space or double space or 12 point font or 11 point font or Calibri or Times New Roman or Courier New or whatever specific cosmetic element it is that's for the individual person you're sending it to to play with and do and sort out. Your job as the writer is to produce the body of this thing, the meat of our meal, so to speak. What this is gonna fundamentally contain are a couple pieces, and we're gonna go through them broadly first, and then we're gonna like chop them down into smaller chunks, okay? Here's what it contains in some way, shape, or form. It's gotta, your query letter has to have 
your character or characters who are your protagonists, whether that's one, whether that's two, whatever. It's got to introduce your protagonists. It has to, has to, has to introduce your, the, the basic conflict of the story, the big plot that the characters are going to get into. It has to, has to, has to include some element of world building, talk about the world, talk about parts of things, talk about sort of the setup of the story, the atmosphere and the mood. It has to, has to, has to, absolutely gold star, impossible otherwise. Mention the title in all caps and the word count. Now, let's come over here to this side of the screen for a little bit of a sidebar. There are some interesting points of view as to whether or not you want to round your, your uh, word count off to the nearest whole digit instead of saying 89,210. Do we round it off to 89,000? Everybody does that differently. For me, I'm in the don't round up camp. Whatever the word count is, is whatever the word count is. I'm a big boy. I can understand that you didn't exactly write 89,000 words. You wrote 89,210. Some people, however, uh, take this as a, as a great affront and they, they, oh my God, I can't believe you didn't round it. How dare you? It, it's not that big a deal. It's some words on a page. But those people have their point of view, and if they say, hey, round it off, the submission guidelines will tell you, or um, they'll tell you outright if you talk to them about querying, do what they say. All when in doubt, follow the directions you're given. But it's got to have your title in all caps, it's got to mention your word count, and it has to mention your genre. If you don't know your genre for whatever reason, let's say you're, you, you're unsure, you know it's science fiction fantasy, or you know it's a romance, or you know it's a Western, or you know it's an action adventure, but you don't know how to break it down past that, it's okay just to call it a science fiction fantasy, or just a Western, or just a romance. You don't always have to drill down to that most critical, like, it's a, let me think of an example, it's a modern conspiracy science fiction fantasy story dealing uh, primarily in the urban vertical space with ideas of complicated, uh, complicated social economy, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't, if you're not comfortable taking it to that level, you don't have to try and force it to that level. It's going to be okay. I think that's one of the big things I really want to get across to you. It's going to be okay. Querying is a subjective process. And what you're, what you're doing is you're sending a subjective thing to subjective people. And you're going to encounter a whole lot of people out in the world who look at this and go, that's eh, not for me. And that's fine. And part of this business probably should be its own class unto itself is being okay with rejection. Query letters are most often the thing most rejected. So accept that as part of the package deal with querying. It's got a title, it's got characters, it's got plot, it's got word count, it's got genre. Does it have everything else? It can have any combination of any other things, but it's got to have those basics. Some of those basics live in very concrete spots in the query. And when uh, you don't put them where they belong, it, it kind of stands out. And it's, um, it's not bad, like we're not going to come and take your keyboard away, but it's certainly something where we want to make sure you're doing it sort of the right way. Now, that said, it's only the right way because we all sort of agreed upon it broadly and loosely and no one's ever really tried to challenge it. Um, it's one of the few times where I'm going to tell you uh, that it's okay to go with the herd. I don't normally tell people that, but just this one time, when we talk about where this stuff lives on the page, go with it. So that's all you need. If you hit those five things, so long as they're there and some of the stuff shows up in the spots it needs to show up in, your query letter can be about whatever you want in whatever angle you want and whatever vector you want to whatever degree you want. One of the most common questions I get when I do workshops on query letters or when I do uh, private sessions with clients for query letters is, is it okay if I dot, 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 and then they fill in the blank with, well, can I, can I have my, can I, can I talk about this part of my book? Talk about whatever part of the book you want. So long as it encourage, as long as you're doing it in a way that encourages somebody to want more information, you can totally do it that way. The, the goal here is to make who's ever reading this thing 
want more information, and the only place they can get that information is to read the manuscript, to ask for pages, to want more from you. This is the point where we're right before the rant, where I want to talk about uh, two parts. I want to talk about spoilers, and I want to talk about query letter rejections, because this is, this is worth pointing out now before we, get, we dive deep with uh, Brooke's submission and, and a few other things. So let's first talk about um, query letter rejection. Chances are uh, you're gonna write a lot of queries, especially if you're looking for traditional publishing, you're gonna write a lot of queries and you're gonna send out batch upon batch upon batch of queries and you're gonna get a lot of rejections. It doesn't matter how strong your pages are and what shape they're in. They could be amazing pages. You could have, you know, a rock solid book. If the query letter is a mess, if the query letter has huge problems and is missing things, those good pages will not get written, uh, get read. I'm sorry. They will not get read. I don't care because I'll never make it past the query. The query doesn't encourage me to say yes. I'm not looking at the pages. The whole thing just hangs out in my inbox till we send a rejection letter. If the query letter is, eh, kind of okay, kind of not okay, it's got some problems, but it's got some interesting stuff into it, then yeah, I will go to the pages just to kind of see if maybe, and it happens, maybe maybe they're not great at queries, but they read a great opening. And that, that can do a lot. That can save, I hate using it that way, but that can save the opportunity. But a rock solid query that leads to rock solid pages is fantastic. It's what we're all aiming for. And my goal with this class for the next however long Audrey lets me talk is to give you a roadmap for querying because I firmly believe that this is a skill you can learn. And it, it's difficult, but not, not impossible. It takes practice. Just like everything else we write. Practice. Repetition. So let's, um, how do we want to do this? Oh, the other thing I wanted to talk about. I almost forgot because then we're going to get to the rant. The other thing I want to talk about, um, placement in query. Don't, if you've never done it before, it's okay to say you've never done it before. And if you've um, failed a million times, you don't have to talk about it. Every time you try it, doesn't matter to who, doesn't matter where, every time is the first time. And when in doubt, write a fresh query. I'm going to show you how. So when in doubt, write a fresh query. Now, let's rant, shall we? There's a thing uh, in querying called COMPS, C-O-M-P-S. COMP is a shorthand for comparative or comparison. It means the same thing. Basically, it's this. It's a reference or a mention of another book written by another author that contains elements similar to what's in your book. It might be theme. It might be plot. It might be atmosphere or world building or arc or anything like that. Most often it's theme, but sometimes it can be other stuff. That's okay too. I don't like comps. I think they're kind of detrimental to a query. And I'd like to tell you why. So it doesn't matter what you're writing. Write whatever book you're writing. But if you mention books, sim when in when you mention books similar to what you're writing, now I'm thinking about those books and I'm not thinking about yours. And your goal with this query is to get me to think about yours so much that I want to read your manuscript. So why are you talking about other people's books? That doesn't sound like, for me, that 300, 330 word count is precious. I don't want to give up part of my space to somebody else's book. Also, and we had talked about this being subjective, um, what if you mention books I don't like? You don't know what I like or don't like. I don't walk around, well, I tend to walk around advertising what I like and I don't like because I'm on social media all the time. But you don't know what I like or what I don't like. And yes, I see the comp question over there in the chat. I'm getting there in a second. But if you mention books I don't like, you're not painting yourself a, fa a, a favorable impression. If you mention the two books last year that I hated, and you tell me that your book is like them, how am I supposed to like your book? Now, that said, 
people are asking for comps. And part of the reason they're asking for comps is because they want to make sure you, the author, know roughly in theory where your book belongs on a shelf. If you walked into a bookstore, a traditional brick and mortar place, where does, where does your book sit? What is it similar to? Because one of that also shows is what, whether or not you've read in your genre. Because being read in your genre, being aware of what's going on in your genre, in terms of trends to a degree, don't go overboard, but being aware of what composes your genre, what conventions there are, what you can expect. When you read a, when you read a, a male, female, hetero romance, you know, you, here are some things to expect. When you read a murder mystery, there are some you know, things to expect, like a murder or a mystery, that kind of thing. And, and part of understanding that is reading in the genre, knowing what's popular, knowing what things your book contains and how to reference them. Because first and foremost, the query is a thing about your book as a whole. It is not just plot and character. This is a dress up version of let me tell you about my book, but I'm going to give it some business trappings. One of the reasons why comps are becoming more popular is because a lot of places have submission forms. And they're not always the greatest piece of UI experience. But um, it usually asks a question like, what books are you, is your book similar to? And what that, got, what that does is it gets turned out, you can't see there's a monitor here, but it gets turned out to a spreadsheet that allows us to sort of figure out who should be reading this, who organizes this, who handles it, and that kind of thing. Um, it helps make one of those business decisions if we're on the fence about whether or not your book is, uh, do we want to ask for pages? Do we want to say no? Do we want to sit on it an extra week? But that's, that's for later in this class. But right now, uh, I want to take a look. I've been dying to do this. I want to take a look at a query letter somebody sent in because this is where we're sort of, you know, this is where rubber meets road or butter meets toast or whatever your choice of uh, metaphor may be. So what I'm going to do is let's see if this works. I'm going to, nope, not that way. I'm going to bring this up and then I'm going to share the screen. And in theory, if I've done this successfully, right in front of you, bang, zoom, should be a query letter. Hey, look at that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute Brooke for a minute because I'm going to ask her a question. Wait, there's a thing. It's blinking. Why is it blinking? Cool. I got it. Hooray. I'm going to move this window out of the way. All right. I'm going to unmute Brooke for a second. Hey, Brooke. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, can I, can I ask you a favor? Sure. Would you mind terribly if I did this live right now, right here? No, go for it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions before I get started. Okay. Okay. Um, can you tell me about your book? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a uh, women's fiction. Okay. Um, it's about a woman who is, um, learning to trust herself and okay. make her own decisions. Awesome. Is it done? Yes, it's done. Fantastic. Uh, the query you sent me that I've got in front of me here, have you, have you shopped that query yet? Have you sent it around? Um, I sent it to, I think about 10 agents so far. Have you heard back? Um, I got one request for a full, but they ult ultimately passed on it. What about everybody else? Um, no, nope, I didn't get any other requests. Okay. Um, do you mind? If, I'm going to, I'm going to get into this now. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute you. So feel free to yell all you want at your muted screen. <laughs> um, and, and then I'm going to unmute you and we'll go through some stuff. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right, cool. First I'm going to, all right, hang on. I'm going to mute you now. So get ready to like curse my good name. Here we go. I'm muting you right now. Okay. I'm going to address this to Brooke, but for the rest of us, we're going to hang out and live vicariously through Brooke. Here we go. Brooke, step one, your query letter is too long. It's about 200 words too long, which is okay because there's a lot in here we can trim. And I'm going to go through this line by line, piece by piece. And then you're going to get a copy of this because I'm going to email it back to you. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is move this window out of the way and scroll down and I'm going to turn on the review thing. I should have done that before, but you know, what are you going to do? Okay. So we're up here. This is fine. I have no problems with this. Great. Good job. Just make sure when you send it out, you put the current date on it. It's obvious, but I think I need to mention that. All right. Um, 
the person you're talking to, awesome. However they want to be addressed, make sure if they're, you know, Ms., Mrs., Mr., Sir, whatever person they are, use it. A uh, colon is fine. A comma is fine. That's great too. Uh, here you go. Right off the bat, I'm right here in this first sentence. Your book title, always, 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 all caps, period. Not bold, not italicized, all caps. Here we go. All caps. Idle in all caps. I'm putting that in caps so you notice it. No bold or nothing. I noticed on your agency website that you're looking for strong women's fiction. I saw your interview on Kirk's reviews that you appreciate well-developed complex characters. I think this might be a good fit for you. Brooke, that's amazing. That's a fantastic first paragraph. Here's why. Um, one, it's got your title. Sure, it's not in all caps, but whatever. That's easy to fix. But more importantly, it indicates that you've been paying attention to the agent and knowing your audience knowing the person to whom you are submitting is critical. And you would be surprised, shocked even, the number of people who were just, hey, Bob, I'm sending you this thing. And it doesn't work. So knowing that you've read something, knowing that you've, what they're looking for is good. And having the confidence to say, I think this might be a good fit for you is excellent. Because if you didn't say that, if you just were like, I saw your interview and I, I know you're looking for stuff here, it sounds kind of tepid. Sounds kind of insecure. The last thing I want to deal with is somebody insecure when I'm about to hand them possibly money. So on we go. Good first paragraph. We're doing great so far. Emmeline, a mom of three in Midwest suburbia, has always been an artist, but the part of... Brooke, I'm making a face. Can you see my face? This first sentence is, one, it's really long, and two, uh, there's so many easier ways to say this. Emmeline, a mom of three in Midwest suburbia, has always been an artist, but the part of her that creates has been shut away for far too long. The important focus of this sentence is not in the first half. You've backloaded this sentence. The important thing is at the back, but you've buried it. I got to dig through all this stuff to get the good stuff. We could just rephrase this sentence this way. Emmeline, as a mom of, I can spell, Mom of three has always been an artist, but lately her creativity has been shut, shut off or lacking or something because you want to drive the reader's attention to the fact that that's the problem. Not that she's a mom, not that she's in the, in the Midwest. I understand those points are important. I agree with you. They're totally important but you want me focused on, I'm introducing a character and I'm introducing a problem. So we're talking about her lack of creativity, the fact that it's been shut off, the fact that she's been sort of divorced from it. It's over here out of the way because three kids are right here. Great. For you, now we're moving on to the next one. For a year, she has dutifully, been dutifully expended. I'm never a fan of the has been phrasing. For a year, she has been dutifully expending every last bit of her time and energy for the betterment of her family and community. Okay, and what? We're going to put a pin in the sentence and we're going to go look at the next sentence. What happens when a reader reads a query letter is if they run to a sentence where something feels a little off, it's, it's kind of like a, uh-huh, and then what? What do you want me to do with the sentence kind of sentence? They go to the next one and see if the, it gives them context on the last one. So this four years sentence, as we're going to call it, doesn't do anything for me. It's not sharp enough to give me an edge. It just sort of explains something that you've kind of already covered over the fact that she's a mom of three in the Midwest, so I know roughly what to expect being, you know, well aware of a person in the Midwest. So it doesn't do enough for me. So let me go to the next sentence. When the, but when the, we're going to talk about this but in a minute. But when the anniversary of the worst day in Emmeline's life brings with it the news that her strange father is dying, she feels desperate urgency. Okay. Brooke, hi. This sentence, the but sentence, and the four-year sentence don't go together. Because the four-year sentence is about the betterment of her family and community. That's one collective, well, two collective groups, family, community, and it's positive. The but sentence is negative. The worst day of her life, her estranged father, a desperate urgency. These are all things with negative connotations. It's a much more impactful sentence. I like this sentence. It's great, but it doesn't mesh well with the dutifully expending every last bit of her time and energy. So here's my very radical proposal. This sentence goes, take it out. Don't eat it. 
the idea that she's been dutifully expending, we can, we can harvest that. We can take that up for later. But for right now, it doesn't live here. So out it goes. I want to keep that idea, though. And this sentence is really long. Side note, Brooke, the sentences in this run a little long. Varying your sentences, both in the query and just in general writing, help move the reader across and down the page. It's a greased slide, right? We want to speed up as we go further down, and we want to build excitement, build momentum. Oh, my God, this is getting good. Oh, my God, I wonder what happens next. Oh, my God, I'm done. <gasps> I better go read the manuscript so I can find out what comes next. That's what we're going for. Long sentences where I got to do one of these and kind of follow along and that serpentine slow decline like I just had a lot of NyQuil aren't going to help me say yes. And God, as a publisher, I want to say yes. Now, here's where we're going to talk about that but. But is one of those words that a lot of, re a lot of writers crutch on. They use it as a, what's called a very strong a pivot, a very strong fulcrum. I'm going to use the word but and then the thing that comes after is this big deal. But, and now I'm going to like tilt the whole story. I'm only like three sentences into your query letter. There's not a lot to tilt. So I want to take the butt out. When the anniversary of the worst day of Emmeline's life brings with it the news for a strange, first of all, you don't need to that. Most of that's can go in a query letter. There, I'm saving you word count. Brings with it news for a strange father is dying. She feels a desperate urgency to do something to mend the broken relationship before it's too late. Okay. There's a lot going on in this sentence. All of a sudden now, I got to care about the worst day of her life. That's one box. We're going to put that over here by my microphone. Now I'm going to care about her estranged father. Then I'm going to care about her estranged father dying. Then I'm going to feel about her desperate urgency. And then I'm going to go over here and feel something about her broken relationship. That's a whole lot of stuff. Where do you want the reader to focus? Focus is critical in a query. You only got 300 some words. So where do you want me to focus? I love all these pieces, but we're gonna have to make some choices. So what I'm gonna do is come in here and I'm gonna rewrite the paragraph. Now this is exactly the same sort of thing I propose to a client in a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you don't have to follow the thing. I'm just going to kind of mash all my ideas together that we've talked about so far. I'm going, to I'm going to harvest some part of the family and community sentence that we deleted, and I'm going to meld it together better. I'm going to pull some of these pieces together. That's what I'm going for. So here's what this looks like. As a mom of three in Midwest suburbia, Emmeline, love the name by the way, is used to giving her all for family and community. What this has led to is her artistic side taking a back seat to everything and everyone else. When she hears the news, her estranged father is dying she is desperately driven i'm not always a fan of adverbs i'm leaving it in right now because if i take it out it buys me a little bit of wiggle room she is desperately driven to mend that relationship it's already broken mend and broken we can pick one we don't need them both relationship before i can spell before it's a little nervous sorry it's too late. All right. All I did was take everything I got in this first paragraph, smush it, tighten it, shorten it. I'm going to unmute Brooke now. And we're going to see if Brooke's ready to, you know, like drive out here to the Midwest and, and throttle me. Brooke. Yeah. What do you think of the proposed paragraph? I love it. Do you see why I made the changes I did? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. It's a plot question. Which I'm going to give you two things. You tell me which is the bigger deal. The dying father or the anniversary of the worst day? Uh, well, they're related. Okay. Are they the same thing? Yes. I mean... Is, does the worst day... On the does the worst day have something to do with the fact of her father's estrangement? Yes. Okay. 
I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to mute you again and we're going to go to the next paragraph because so far you're doing great. <laughs> one more question. Okay. Why did you take that many words to get me there? Um, because it started out so long just trying to squeeze the whole plot down. Okay. And so I think I was just trying to put all the information in there because it is hard to pick out what needs to go into the query letter. That's been the oh. most difficult thing. Okay. So I'm going to answer that and then we're going to, I'm going to mute you again and then we're going to keep going because you're doing great. Okay. When you, whenever you're writing, and this isn't just you, Brooke, I mean, this is like everybody, but I'm talking to you, Brooke. So the query letter has an angle by default. It's a particular view. It's a slice. Through, it's a lens through which I will view the whole story. I don't need the whole story because that's what I got the manuscript for. But much like a movie trailer gives me a particular view of this story, that's what I need. I need a movie trailer. So there will always be other trailers. We'll release trailers left, right, and center, unedited, red band, all that stuff. But right now, in a query letter, if you're ever trying to figure out, what do I put in? What do I take out? What do I say? When do I say it? Figure out overall what kind of, how do you want this query letter to be about? I want to write an emotional query letter. I want to write a query letter that talks about Emmeline's struggles. I want to talk about art. I want to, you find the thing, I'm making a broad gesture, I know I shouldn't, but you want to find the thing that drives this particular view of the story and build around it. So right now, in our old paragraph and in the proposed new paragraph, we're building around the idea of estranged father, separation. Separation from them and separation from our artistic side. So we, our common ground is separation. Separation is going to be a theme that we're going to see, I'm going to try and find through the rest of this query letter. Because you're writing basically a story about a woman who is separated from stuff who's got to put the pieces back together. I think that's what you've been talking about. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that works. Okay. So that's how you'd figure out, well, what do I put in and what do I don't? You find a single through line that kind of weaves its way through all the story elements that you want. How you'd figure this out if you were at home watching this later and you're like, how do I do this? Write down make a list. I'm a big list guy. Love lists. Make a list of all the things that happen in your story, whether that's scene by scene or chapter by chapter or action beat by action beat, outline point, whatever you want to call it. Find those things. This happens and this happens and this happens and this happens. She deals with this. She loses this. She gains this. This guy shows up. This lady shows up, whatever. Find things other than the fact that, oh, they're all in the story. Find things that tie them all together. Here, after digging around and talking to Brooke, we found that it's about separation. So we're going to pose this query around separation. And it's going to pull together. Because now all of a sudden we have a, a, a test, uh, not a test subject, uh, a way of testing this. Well, we look at a sentence. Does it have anything to do with separation? Can we rewrite it to be about separation? Yes, no. If no, we're going to chuck it. If yes, we're going to polish it and make sure it fits. Some of this stuff's going to go by the wayside, and that's okay. It's not saying we're not, we're not lying and saying, oh, that's not in the book. It's just that right now when I talk to you about this, it's not coming up in the query. Just like when we watch a movie trailer, we're not going to talk about, you know, 43 minutes into this thing, somebody gets in a car. It's not that they don't get in a car. It's just that you don't need that for this query letter right now, right here in this space. Make sense, Brooke? Yes. Awesome. I'm going to mute you now and we're going to go to the next paragraph. You're doing great, Brooke. Good job. And can I just give myself a gold star for not swearing? I'm really, really proud of myself right now because we're going to get good now. So on we go. All right. Growing up, art was Emmeline's passion and she dreamed of sharing it with the world. Oh, Brooke, why is this sentence starting this paragraph after the first paragraph was already about art? I don't know. I want to put a pin in this. Let's go to the next one. Her father had more practical plans for her future and didn't want her wasting her time on something so frivolous. That's the long way to say a short thing. Okay. So, I already know right now, I want to keep the art. And I want to keep this, this part of the separation, at least as you've presented it so far, is about art and her dad and her dad's opinion and her opinion. Separation. So, I know I want to keep this about art so far. I haven't read further. Granted, when people read query letters for decision-making about publishing, they're going to read the whole thing. I'm doing this in pieces so that I can show you how to take it apart. 
So I know right now I want to keep it about art. It's important. She had kept working in secret. You don't need the had. Because if it's already done, the amount of time that had passed since she did it is immaterial. She kept working in secret, pouring her entire being into the self-portrait. It would be the crowning achievement. Man, Brooke, that's a long sentence to get me one good point that you buried in the beginning. She worked in secret to make a crowning achievement of her high school career. I really want to point out that in high school, it's kind of hard to say you've got a high school career because, you know, you're in high school. I haven't been in high school in two decades. And I didn't have a career then. I was barely trying to figure out how to make a girl like me. So um, I'm going to keep some parts of this, and I know I'm going to cut some parts of this. The day her father laid her eyes on her life's work. Okay, we're building somewhere. This is good. All he could see was a lie. Oh, oh, wait, hang on. Hang on. Whoa, hold. Where's my, I don't have my little red. Normally I carry a little red flag and I wave it. Um, lie is a different conceptual point than separation. So I'm going to unmute Brooke now and ask her a question. Hey, Brooke. Hi. What's up with the lie? How is it a lie? Um, so her dad wanted her to stop um, pursuing an artwork because it was affecting her studies. Sure, totally. And so he wanted her to give it up, but she wasn't willing to. So that's why she was working in secret. Right, but what's the lie? The fact that she was keeping it from him and telling him that she had stopped doing it. Aha, aha, that's the lie. The lie is that she told him she wasn't when she was. Right. That part, the working in secret, is sort of present in the query because it's the first part of the sentence. But the fact that she continued to do it despite him is unclear. So you've, you've taken lie. I see where you want to go, but you kind of smushed it in there. So it doesn't quite work. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. It's just that if we're going to build around it because the lie is this, is the lie the source of the estrangement? Um, yeah, sort of. So, sort of is fine. I'll take sort of. Sort of is a ballpark. I'm good with sort of. So if we're, and we know in the next sentence, he's going to get angry, shred the painting, destroy her self-worth and, you know, boot her out into the world. Okay. I want to keep those parts, but I want to make the lie and the anger behind the lie clearer to stay in line with our theme of, est of estrangement and separation. Okay. So I'm going to mute you and then rewrite this paragraph. Thank you for answering my questions. I'm also willing to bet that I muted you and then you said you're welcome, which is going to bring me chuckles later. Um, she always wanted to share her art with the world. Her father, though. And we use though to sort of set up what's called an offset. An offset in a query is two ideas that are presented at roughly the same time and space in the query, but they're of differing value and differing view. It's this, but it's also that contrast, right? So her father, here's her view, though his view. Her father, though, thought art too frivolous. Now, granted, this sounds like John. If I wanted to sound like Brooke, I'd probably put a pronoun in here. Thought her art and probably a verb because that's how Brooke makes sentences because I've just heard Brooke speak a few times. Uh, if you want to, it doesn't make a difference. If you wanted to tighten it because, oh my God, I'm running tight on word count. Like, oh God, the clock's ticking. Trim those words out. They're a little bit fluffy. We can, we can lean it up. You can leave it in too. That's fine. It's whatever makes it sound most like you. Uh, the thought her art was too frivolous and that she should focus on her studies. So, Emily lied, saying that she would. Hang on, I have to ask Brooke a question. Hang on, I lost my cursor. Hey, Brooke. Hi. Hi. Um, when Emily lies to her dad does she say she's going to give it up yes okay thank you i'm going to unmute you back now all right so we know emily lied so emily lied saying she would give up painting or nope type in the box john it would come on fingers give it up while also working in secret on what could be her 
crowning high school achievement, a word I can never spell right on the first try. Uh, crowning high school achievement. Now, hang on. If, now, granted, I've not read the manuscript, but if Brooke, uh, not Brooke, if Emmeline in high school has other achievements, she wins a spelling bee, she gets a win at some sporting event, she gets to find the good shoes on sale, I don't know what. But if she has other crowning achievements, other big deal moments, that's fine. She can still have them in the story. That's great. But I'm only highlighting this one because that's part of our view. That's the lens through which I'm looking at this story. One direction, one way, one time. What could be her crowning achievement? When she unveils it to the world, her father's anger is. Now, I want to find a way to describe his anger because this is the negative. This is the thing in part that helps fuel the separation and break their relationship and helps make clear that divide. Her father's anger is intense. You could also use palpable, heavy, incredible, big word, big drama. The bigger the word, uh, so long as we're not hyperbolic, the bigger the word, the more intensely we can convey this chasm between these two characters. Her father's anger is intense as he shreds the painting, taking her self-worth along with it. He, and now we're gonna finalize it. I wanna separate some of these verbs. I wanna separate some of the things he does to underscore this whole idea of, you know, dude's angry, action, 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 separation is constantly growing because of what he does. He, um, well, if I were writing this, I'd say boots her to the curb. Um, he throws her out into the cold world. Um, if the phrase to make it on her own shows up in text as is, I'd put it in quotes here. If it doesn't, I'm just going to lift it from the same paragraph and then just don't do it in quotes. If it belong, If it's a quoted thing, if you're referencing directly from the book, use it. It adds a little bit more punch. It adds a little bit more impact. Uh, to make it on her own. All I did, take the same contents, slice them up, break it into pieces, put a little focus to it. Now, after years of letting others tell her who she is, she's decided to reclaim the pieces. Okay, here's, here's a very common writer thing. Happens in queries, happens in manuscripts all the time. Deciding to reclaim a thing is not the same as reclaiming a thing. It's like thinking about having lunch and having lunch. Thought is not action in and of itself. So, I gotta unmute Brooke. Hey Brooke. Hi. You're doing great. Thanks for <laughs> sticking around with this. So you've got this sentence in the third paragraph where she's decided to reclaim. Mm -hmm. um, is she actually reclaiming or is she just thinking about it? Does she um, go stuff? She starts working toward it. Okay, so then she's not deciding. She just goes and reclaims. Sure. I'm just taking the idea and making it active. An active idea, no matter what verb we're talking about, an active idea is always going to translate better to the reader because the person reading the query is looking to see if the character has agency, the ability to make choices, B, opportunity, things to actually do, and three, Motivation, reasons to do it. By shortening the verb and trimming it down to just reclaim. Because once you start reclaiming, the decision to reclaim is sort of in there. Like, I had to decide to do it. That's why I'm doing it. But if we just get to the doing it, decision's covered. Make sense? Could you say, like, she begins to reclaim? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Because it's active, right? It's, it's not, the, the problem with decide or thinks or plans is that they're cerebral. That we, right. you can't see somebody plan, right? You can't see somebody decide, but you can see somebody starting to do stuff because it speaks to a broader range of actions. I'm, dis, I'm deciding to pick up my glass of water or I start to pick up my glass of water. An active verb is almost always, there are exceptions, of course, there's exceptions, but an active verb is almost always going to do a better job of getting the whole idea across from your brain to somebody else's. So yes, Brooke, you could say starts to. Okay. Okay? 
I'm going to mute you now and we're going to go back through this. You're doing awesome. Thank you for being the brave volunteer in my hot seat. Now, after years of letting others tell her who she is, a small point, uh, the query hasn't really indicated she's been doing that. Not, not my rewrite, certainly, but not the original query either. There's been no indication that other people have told her what, who, what or who she is, just that she wasn't supposed to be doing this one activity. That's not the same as defining who you are as a person. If, if you're trying to partner those things together and say, well, who you are is not an artist, then you've got to establish prior to this phrase that art is who she is. You didn't do that. When I first read this manuscript, when I first read the query letter draft last night, making my notes, I was trying not to swear. When I was going through and making my notes, one of the reasons I probably would reject this is because you've proposed a lot of ideas and they're good ideas, but you proposed a lot of ideas sort of back to back to back. There's this and there's this and there's this, because as you said, it's sort of hard to know what goes in and what doesn't. This is why we streamline and organize. You're, you're, they're fine ideas. We just got to find a better presentation for them and trim the ones that don't really fit our vision. Now, after years of letting others tell her, tell her who she is, she's decided to reclaim the pieces of herself she lost that day. Well, the that day part's kind of obvious. So even if I didn't trim this sentence, I take the that day out because we've only been talking about that day. She's determined to pursue her lifelong dream or long buried dream of becoming a famous painter and showing her dad what she's capable of before it's too late. Okay. This sentence is a great sentence. Actually, both these first two sentences are excellent, but they're redundant. The challenge I would give you, were you a client of mine? I'd tell you to pick one because they're both good, but they both, both can't survive the Thunderdome that is query revision. Two things enter, only one leaves. So the first sentence is nice. It's good. It's accurate. It's well phrased, but it's broader than this second sentence, which gives it a little bit more clarity. My, it, they are very beautiful sentences. They really are. But the second one is more focused. The second one speaks more directly to the character's motivation and the character's decision. So I'm going to tell you to take part of the first sentence and merge it with the second sentence to make a new third, well, what will be a new opening to this. For in a moment, I'm going to add a break just so I can keep track of everything because it's easier for me. Um, she plans to, nope, I don't want to use plans because we just talked about that being, uh, she starts, that's the word Brooke used. She starts reclaiming pieces of her lost self. And then I'm going to bring in that second sentence, determined to pursue her long, I love the phrase long buried dream. Long buried dream of becoming, I'm just going to lift the sentence straight, becoming a famous painter and showing her dad what she's, now I'm going to add a word in here because I want to slant the reader's perspective. I want to give them a little bit of an edge. I want to give them something to kind of reflect on and think about because while this is good, you could leave this alone. Watch what happens when you read it and think about it. If I put the word truly in, what she's truly capable of before it's too late. Putting in truly all of a sudden makes her art singularly important to her because all of a sudden now we are talking about that separation in a different way. Now it's not just, well, my dad doesn't like my art. Now it's this is who I really am, fundamental. And it speaks to that separation of my dad doesn't or didn't understand who I am. Here I am over here being who I am. Much greater separation, much more evocative, which is always a plus. But more importantly for a reader of a query, it's much more relatable. What you're doing in a query letter over the course of the paragraphs, I don't care what the story is, but over the course of these paragraphs, you are building a bridge between you, the writer, and me, the reader of the query who's deciding whether or not to make it rain on your happy day. So you're trying to connect me to something. 
I'm not going to connect very deeply with the character named Emmeline because it's just a name. It's cosmetic. She might as well be called Daphne or something. But I can connect to the idea of father estrangement. I can connect to the idea of denying who you are because other people are defining you. I can connect to the idea of going out and proving what you're truly capable of. Hitting those deeper emotional points is always a more effective way of connecting no matter what the story is. So whether we're adding in like, I don't know, not that your story has it, but if we had aliens and ninjas come up in here, we could still make that work. We could still find a way to go, yeah, I totally want to read a story about ninjas and stuff. So long as we could find a way to make it relatable. Because writing, no matter what we're writing, is all about building relationships. From imagination to creator, from reader to experience. You're always building some kind of bridge in some direction, somewhere, sometime. So, what she's truly capable of before it's too late. And then we're going to come down here. As she tries to carve out time to paint, it seems like her kids can't survive. You don't need the even. You've already established it. They can't survive five minutes without her, and her fellow soccer moms are ruthless in pointing out all the ways she's shirking her duties. Awesome. Why do I like this sentence? I like this sentence because it's grounding the story. It's no longer just dad issues happening in sort of in nebulous space. Now it's a thing where it's like, well, here's the real world knocking on her door while we're going through this. Love this sentence. I like the idea. The presentation, again, as per usual, a little long, but I like the gold here. We can mine this for good stuff. Her blissful marriage turns into a power struggle as her husband thwarts her. Oh, Brooke. Oh, come on, Brooke. We were doing good. The wheels just came off our apple cart. Why did our wheels come off the apple cart, Brooke? There's a lot going on in this paragraph. There's all these different extra things. I understand you're trying to show like other stuff happening in the world. But for every time you bring up the kids and soccer moms and her husband and the scars and this and that, we're moving away from that lens of separation. We're moving away from that idea of identity. And we're just piling stuff on her. Man, it is really hard not to swear. We are just piling on uh, the complications to her efforts. And that's fine. There can be complications. I'm not saying we don't need complication. I'm saying we don't need to back the whole truck up and dump them on her. We get it. It's hard. And it doesn't, when we rewrite it, which I'm about to do, I want to focus and narrow this stuff down. I don't need to know all these things for them to exist in the story. She starts reclaiming pieces of her lost self, determined to pursue. Or I'm just going to copy and paste this sentence because it's really nice. And I'm on another page. When her kids... The other soccer moms and her husband all seem to conspire in finding ways she's at fault or failing. Emma, I can't even spell. Emmeline must learn. To trust herself enough to be her own person. She must. I'm never happy with the idea of is force because that makes me think there's like a guy like with a gun to her, like do this or else. That's, that's forced, right? Like she's not forced. She's just really strongly compelled to. So I want to take forced out because it sounds like it's not her direct choice. I want it to be her choice. She must choose because choose is always stronger than decide it means the same thing but it's a word choice she must choose she was forced to decide whether doing what she loves to her natural or tearing apart her life she must choose between the life she's built and earning her dad's approval while now i'm using while because i want to contrast so this is my thinking face so she must choose between the life she's built. That's the stuff that happened in this paragraph. And earning her dad's approval. That's the statement in this other sentence. While also forging her own identity. What I want to do is tie all these pieces together. We've been talking about separation. We've talked about complications. But fundamentally, whenever we talk about separation, we talk about individualization, the idea of becoming their own person. And that's the note I want to close this query on for the reader because now we've set up these stakes. 
here's what this lady's going for. This is what she's got going against her. This is her choice. The implicit question, the unwritten question here is, do you want more information? Ideally, going through these paragraphs, one after the other, here's some fact, here's some emotion, here's some fact, here's some emotion. You can relate to these things. Here's the challenge of the story. Should lead you to go, yeah, I do want more information. And this is how you get it. There you go. I Now we've covered the what it, what's usually called the prompt of the story or the body of the query. It's the same thing. Most of the time you're going to see it referred to as the body of the query. It's the what's the story about. Then we get into what's called the business paragraph. There are more technical names, but it's just easier if we all agree it's the business paragraph because this in this paragraph, the last paragraph, this is where you get stuff like the title, the word count, the genre, comps, maybe, um, as, a lot, uh, yeah, as well as some author bio detail. You have cats, you have kids, you like chickens, I don't know. Whatever details make Brook Brook, we'll get there. I, would, I do want to point out that she's got right here, I'm a debut author. There is zero things wrong with saying it's your first book or saying it's your, your debut author or anything like that. You can totally, absolutely, anytime, just come flat out and go, I'm new at this. It's fine. There's no shame. There's no stigma. Look how brave you're being, brand new person who's never done this before. You are doing one of the toughest things in publishing, asking somebody to say yes to you. That's really hard. Good job being brave, putting it right out there. It doesn't have to live in the first sentence. In fact, it shouldn't live in the first sentence, but it does need to live in the paragraph. What should be in the first sentence? The title of your book. And normally, I gotta go back, her favorite color, which is a really good title. So I wanna take this paragraph and I'm gonna start rewriting it down here. And then we'll get to your sign off in a second. But we'll come down here. Her favorite color. Okay, I wanna go through this paragraph first before we build the rewrite. I'm a debut author with a background in business and child rearing, currently working as a fitness instructor, okay? Some random facts about me. Brooke, I don't want random facts. I want like bespoke, hand-picked facts that make Brooke sound like the most amazing Brooke I could ever find. I want you to stand out and be proud of yourself. Don't give me random, give me what makes Brooke Brooke. My favorite place to read is a good climbing tree. I like that. Parks and Rec is my favorite TV show. Don't care. It's a fine show. This is not the place to tell me that though. And I believe a lot of problems can be solved with the right kind of chocolate. I like that. Why do I like that? It's technically in the business, we call that quirky, but really it's a humanizing trait. The more human you can come across in a business paragraph, especially the latter half of a business paragraph, the more I'd want to talk to you. The more I'd want to go, I'm intrigued, Brooke. Let's send me some pages and see if we, we can work out. Um, I think this book is, comp here's your comp sentence. I think this book is, com is uh, comparable to other contemporary women's fiction, such as Crimes Against a Book Club by Kathy Cooperman and Hello, Central and All by Laura Dave. Awesome. Because they share a lighthearted tone and focus on family relationships. Awesome. That's a good comp sentence. Whenever you mention comps, you're going to want them italicized. The only thing in all caps should be your stuff. Because it's yours italicize other people's stuff, capitalize it as you did, and that's fine. But your stuff is your stuff. Hang on a minute. Brooke wrote me a note. I want to make sure I understand this. The random facts was something a particular agent asked for. Okay. Well, then Brooke, leave it in. I didn't know that. You did. You did your homework. You leave it in. Don't listen to John for that part of that sentence. Um, my men, now we're going back down to my manuscript has completed 88,000 words. Okay, there's one, maybe two little bits here that's kind of a thing. We never, ever, 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 ever query incomplete manuscripts. So telling me it's complete is just eating up word count. Don't send incomplete work, so obviously what you're sending me is complete. My manuscript, is, if we take that out though, my manuscript is at 88,000 words and ready to send upon request. It just sounds a little clunky, right? It's, it's accurate, but it's messy. So what we do is we take uh, this blurb, the math, that's literally what we call it when we read queries, the math. Uh, we take the math and we put it usually in the sentence with the title. 
and then we talk about some of the other elements. Uh, the one thing I'm missing here is, I wanna make sure it's up just up the top. Yeah, it's entirely, it's sort of absent. You didn't mention the genre specifically about the book. You talked about the genre she likes, but you didn't like plant your flag and go, hey man, this is my book. This is the genre it's in. I'm going to assume, and you can correct me in a second, I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, I'm gonna assume that this is women's fiction. That's how you wanna define this. Rook, is that fair to say? Yes. All right, so that's the phrase I'm gonna use when you use women's fiction as a thing. If you've, do you have any more specifics? Are we talking, do you wanna go with contemporary women's fiction? Yeah, it is contemporary. All right, then we're gonna go with contemporary women's fiction, okay? Okay. Um, but I'm just gonna scroll back down. Thanks, Brooke. I'm muting you again, by the way, in case you're talking and I'm like, I'm waiting for me to hear you. I, it's cool. Okay. Her favorite color is contemporary women's fiction at 88,000 words. Side note, 88,000 words is perfectly positioned inside women's fiction. Women's fiction generally runs 80 say 81, 81 and a half, all the way up to 96, eh, 95 and a half, 96. You could probably stretch it to 97, but you better justify it. You better have like a rock solid plot or something. But women's fiction tends to live in that just short of um, what is generally referred to as big space. Big space is anything over uh, 80,000 and under 100,000. 100,000 is usually what's referred to as epic space. Uh, it's contemporary women's fiction at 88,000 words. Similar to, and I'm going to take the comps, and I'm going to match the comps all in one sentence. Similar to, and I'm just going to copy and paste. Because if you already did a good job, why would I fiddle with it? This is my debut novel, period. Certified, plan a flag. Currently, I work as a fitness, I can spell, fitness instructor. Nope, I don't wanna put it that way. I don't wanna, what I'm pausing on is whether or not I wanna contrast your current work with your background. And that makes your current work and background sound oppositional, and they're not oppositional. They're related, but not necessarily directly, unless you are a fitness instructor for child rearer, which is possible, but not critical to this query letter. This is my debut novel. So we've got a choice here to make, and it, there's, this is a fielder's choice. This is, this is a choice for Brooke. Um, because I'm going to write this John's way, Brooke's going to write it Brooke's way, and that's fine. What you need to do here is you don't have to talk about your current job. You can, nothing wrong with it if you want to, totally fine. But what I really want to get to where the gold of this is, I want to get to those random facts. So what I might suggest is just paste in this. All right there. Done. That way, I don't have to, not that I don't want to hear about your job. I'm sure your job is awesome. I like when people talk about their job, but it doesn't fit right here, right now. If you want to put it in, it's going to live down here. Um, I have a background in business and child rearing and currently work as a fitness instructor. That's where that would live if you want to put it in. I don't think you need to put it in. You might want to try it once and see, and then try it without and see what your responses are. Because it's, it's okay, but we've, we've covered enough ground. And then we get down to the end. Thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Here's, how do I put this? This is where um, we get a little rigid in query land. I don't know why. We just do. Thank you for your time and consideration. That is pretty much 99% of the time, the ending to use with any query. Because hearing from you is sort of implied in this relationship. Either you're not going to hear from me because we're gonna you know, walk away uh, and 
or you are going to hear from me going, yes, no, whatever. So that's sort of implied in this dynamic. So but thank you for your time and consideration. It's respectful. It's businessy. And it, it's, a, it's what's called a terminator. It just stops things. Best which is Brooke Williams. That's your query. So I'm going to unmute Brooke. Uh, I'm going to get some opinions. And then I would absolutely positively love to answer questions. If you don't have questions, that's fine. I'm just going to go grab another query letter then. But uh, if you have questions, I don't care what they are. I want you to ask them. Uh, I'm, in fact, going to demand that if you have questions, you ask them. Even if you think they're silly. Even if you think somebody's answered them already. I want to help you. So prep some questions. I'm going to talk to Brooke. Hey, Brooke. Hi. How you doing? Good. Good. You see what I did with your stuff? Yes. What do you think? I think it's great. Does it make sense? Yeah, for sure. It's a whole other way of looking at it. I mean, I've had people help me with query letters before, and it's never made as much sense as what you did. Oh, I love hearing that. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful to hear. Did I, now I've got some questions just because I'm teaching this class thing. Did I completely misrepresent your story? Um, no, I don't think so. Did I make up anything that isn't in your manuscript in some way, shape, or form? No. Did I completely ruin the fact that it's women's fiction, or does it suddenly feel like it's not Brooke's story? No. Would you consider, for me, as a personal favor, uh, trying this new revised query sometime and letting me know how it goes? For sure. Thank you. That's it. No worries. This was a really good query. The biggest issues were, one, it was really long. It was just wordy. And two, it had a lot of stuff kind of all over the place that just needed to be pulled together tighter. Those two factors, length and looseness, for lack of a better term, are the number two, are the number one and number two issues in querying. Almost everybody writes too long and almost everybody throws a million things at the wall and then hopes that some things stick and the connections between those things are apparent. But if you, if you sit down intentionally and do it and go, okay, I want to talk, I want to take it in this direction. I want to go this specific way about this specific thing because it's one way to view my story. It's not the only way. You could take these same facts and write, it, write a query about identity and about MLI not really having one and then discovering one or going back to one she thought she lost. You could write it about identity and tell the same, with the same elements, just shuffle them around a little bit, write a couple inter, different interlinking sentences, and it's the same thing. So there's lots of different ways to represent the story. We just picked one and went with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much for jumping in the hot seat. I really super appreciate it. No um, problem. Thanks for writing a good, like you, you brought good material to work with. Uh, thanks, Brooke. I appreciate it. I'm going to mute you again, though. Not because I don't care. It's just because I've got other stuff to do. Um, all right. So I'm going to unmute everybody in a minute and see if there are questions. But overall, this query, I'm going to save this query before I forget. Um, I'm going to, where's my stop share? There it is. Uh, that query was really strong. It worked well. It had all the right pieces. It was really effective in its, in, in its progress. We moved from thing to thing to thing right down the line. It, we didn't, when we ran into a stumbling block, we stopped. And we looked at, okay, how do I connect what it, what's in front of me, the thing I'm stuck on, with what I've already written? You don't want to try and introduce a new direction all of a sudden. You don't want to try and kind of like end around and come back to it. You want to make sure you're always moving in one consistent direction from beginning to end of the query. One straight, relatively smooth, it doesn't always have to be perfect, line. Now, having said that, one of the things I do want to talk about are how some genres have a few different permutations of query letters. And I want to single out just for a second, the romance people. Hi guys. In romance writing, there is, it's not a preferred method of querying. It's an expected method of querying called an AB or a split query. And it looks like this. Your first paragraph is about one protagonist, usually the woman, usually your lead character. Your second paragraph is about your other protagonist, most often in hetero romance, the man, or in non-hetero romance, it's the person being pursued, the other party of the love interest, you know? And then the third paragraph presents stakes. Well, here's what they've got to do. They've got to fall in love because the castle's up for sale and the werewolves and the moors and whatever else you got going on. 
all happens in the third paragraph and then we get to the business paragraph. And that's a fine, okay construction. It's not the end of the world. But for the vast majority of people who use that format, their first two paragraphs are kind of skimpy because it's focused so tightly on character. And that third paragraph is like a small wall of text because there's the story and the plot and the risks and the love and the usually lots of adjectives about how much they want to like be shirtless with each other or something. And that can be the issue. Whenever you're in a rom if you're writing romance queries, the thing to do whenever you introduce character, I don't care who the character is, the thing to do is partner the character with what's at stake for them. You can have your, you know, uh, let me think of a modern equivalent. Your all business, no social life, slightly clumsy, could be played in a movie by Sandra Bullock or Katherine Heigl protagonist. Describe all or all you want, so long as you make it clear by the end of that first paragraph that this is something driving her without treading on old cliches of, you know, she's never had time for love. Yeah, and then what? What, what else you got? And then you bring in the guy or the, the woman or the, the other person, whoever they might be, and you introduce them, but what's driving them? And it's the, re, it's the two drives, drive of paragraph one, drive of paragraph two, that should lead the reader into paragraph three so that it's focused, so that it's not just, oh, here is a whole big pile of things. Sort it out amongst yourselves. Um, I don't like A, B query structure for romance. I think you can write romance query structure the same as every other kind of query structure because the focus in romance should be thematic. A thematic query is that query, much like we just did with Brooke, where we take a story element, not necessarily a plot point, but something in the story, something the story is about at its core, something relatable, and we build from it and go through it. Brooke's story was about separation and identity. Romance is about finding love, falling in love, losing love, gaining love discovering yourself, discovering something else. Those are the things that base every romance in 90 something percent of Western literature. In Eastern literature, you add in other factors, but that's your, there's your core. So as long as we stay in our little base, we can go in any direction we want. It doesn't always need to be three paragraphs. That's the other thing I want to talk about. Yes, with Brooks, there's three or four paragraphs. You can have six you can have eight if your paragraphs are real short. There's nothing wrong with that. You can have a one sentence paragraph. It's not the end of the world. Go for it. If, you're, if that sentence is really impactful, like I can't swear here, bang, zoom, pow, oh no, something where you want to singularly draw the reader's attention to one line on the page and then do something about it. It's fine. Yes, you can curse in a query. Yes, you can reference brands. Yes, you can... Um, talk about just about whatever the things you cannot do in a query because it is no longer, you know, the eighties. You do not want to write a query from the perspective of your character telling the story. We, that, that fell out of favor like 30 years ago. Don't just don't. Um, it's, it's kind of sad. It makes you look really out of step. Uh, and also it almost never works well. The other thing you don't want to do, hang on, there's a message. I can't ignore you. You're running this thing, Audrey. Um, so the uh, other thing you don't want to do, you don't want to write in character. You also don't want to recap the entire plot to every degree because that's what the synopsis is for, which is a different class, which is a different thing. It's okay to spoil the plot in a query. Really, truly it is. If that helps you sort of lens it, if that helps you kind of give the direction you want to go into the, to the intensity you want to go in because you're trying to, you know, build around that relationship between reader and, and write, uh, writer, then yeah, absolutely spoil. It's not the end of the world. Uh, we always talk all the time about how movie trailers spoil the movie or it gives some part of it away, but it's part of driving you to see the whole thing. And that's totally acceptable in a query letter as well. Those are the basics. That's it. Doesn't need to be more, doesn't need to, you know, we can get into sentence structure as long as it's varied, it's okay. I'm going to unmute. I would love, absolutely positively love questions. Otherwise, I'm going to go grab a really, really bad query written by a New York Times bestselling author and we'll all have a good laugh. So let me unmute everybody and see if there are questions. Yeah.
Hello, everybody, and all their questions and all their things. How are you? I love this. Thank you so much, John. This is wonderful. You're welcome. I really love doing these. So, I, think, uh, I think there's some unmuted that. Uh, oh, no. Well, then I will remute everybody. Okay. Well. okay, or not. I'm still doing it anyway. If you have a question, by all means, go unmute yourself and ask your questions. Um, let's see. Some other questions I prepped for. If English is not your first language, or if this is the first book in that language, whether it's not English, if you're writing, let's say something in Swedish, uh, say so. It's okay. It's not going to automatically disqualify you. There are a number of things that will automatically super immediately disqualify you from querying. And most of them have to do with really obvious social norms. Like, don't get all threatening. Don't get violent. Don't, don't get really crass. Um, don't like, you know, bully people. Don't be a jerk really. But other than that, so long as you're querying to the right person, if you're sending it, you know, if you're querying an agent who represents science fiction authors, it would be expected that you're querying a science fiction book. Or if you're sending something to women's fiction, then you want, um, I see your question, Brooke, I'm going to get there in one second. If you're sending something to women's fiction, make sure it's women's fiction. Don't send some unrepresented genre to that agent, editor, or publisher thinking that your stuff's going to be the thing that makes them change their mind. It, it doesn't work that way. It, there, you're not. I don't, I, it might be the best book in the whole wide world. It's not going to suddenly make that agent rep the entire genre just for you. Sorry. All right, I'm going to go answer Brooke's question. You mentioned the main conflict needs to be included. Do we also need to give some space in the query to the antagonist? The, the word there I want to highlight is need. You don't need to. You can if you want to. Because the antagonist is a character. You can bring up that character however you want. You don't need to. This is not one of those things where we have to be sort of like fair and balanced and show everything from every side. You can, you can skip that. If you want to give some room for the antagonist, do it. But make sure you do it purposefully. Because you can talk about a conflict without bringing up the antagonist. Because the conflict is usually something emotional. It's evocative. It's internal. The fact that it's personified or led by a single guy, an antagonist, whatever, is fine. But you don't need to. You can if you want to. One of the things I want to caution you against in doing that, though, is that it starts to kind of walk away a little from being just a singular lens. If we start bringing in this character and this thought and their motivation, what they're doing and all the, we, we've started to spread our view a little bit too much. We've lost that singular focus. And we're kind of like a little all over the place. And that's what we want to try to avoid because that's how queries end up getting either silenced or rejected and neither of which I want for you. So you don't need to, you can, if you want to, if it fits the through line that you're building, if it doesn't, it doesn't, that's fine too. I hope I answered your question. I know it probably wasn't as clear cut as the, what you might've been hoping for, but yes. Okay. Any other questions while I go grab the other uh, query letter that we're all going to have a good laugh at? I'm going to save this for Brooke, though. Let's see. Where did I put it? Here it is. Close that. Come back and see if any questions, comments, issues, etc. No? All right. Let's go look at a really bad query written by somebody who should know better. They do know better. I asked them to write me bad queries on purpose um, because I thought they'd be fun teaching tools. So this, I, I will preface this now. This story does not exist. This is not a real book. This is not a real author. I mean, they're a real person, but this is entirely made up on purpose for the sake of teaching. Um, this is a bad query. Uh, it's particularly difficult once you've been writing queries for a while to purposefully write a bad one that breaks all the rules where you should know better. Because as you're writing it, you're going to want to go like, I can't write that. That's terrible. This is bad on purpose. So, uh, Gorgeous George and the Empire of Stars, a, a book in the Dead Tomorrow series, is a manuscript about surviving disaster and looking great doing it. Part of that sentence is okay. 
and it's not the title part. You never want to directly call your thing the manuscript in the book unless we're in the business paragraph. Because prior to getting to the business of word count and title, we're just telling the story. You want to start your query, whatever it is, you want to start that query where the action is. And I don't mean action like plot. I mean, start me somewhere where it's going to grab my attention and hold me there. What holds me there in that first sentence is surviving a disaster and looking great doing it. I think that's a cool phrase. It's the best phrase in the sentence. It's the only phrase I would keep to rewrite. It draws themes from Star Wars, A Raisin in the Sun, Eight Mile, and Plummet to Soar. Uh, all of those things are actual pieces of media. Um, the problem is, I don't know which themes it draws from which book. Also, some of those books don't have themes relatable to the other things I've mentioned. The themes in Plummet to Soar are not the same themes as A Raisin in the Sun. They're just not. They're two totally different stories. So if you're going to bring up comps and you're going to talk about themes and comparisons and how your books, not so much the genealogy of your book, but the architecture of your story, be really careful that you're picking material that goes together. Just because you like these things doesn't mean they naturally fit into the atmosphere, vibe, tone, or story you're telling. I love these things, but it's very hard to compare 8 Mile and Star Wars when I'm trying to explain, you know, a romance novel. They're not primarily romance stories. It is my debut novel, okay, and the first of an 11-book series. What I want to highlight there is the fact that you've brought up a series. We're going to have some publisher real talk right now. I know it is very popular to write multiple series sort of in sequence. I'm going to write three books, and then I'm going to write three more, and then I'm going to package them and do this and do that. I get it. I hear you. I understand. But from a pure publisher standpoint, it's not going to do you any bit of good if that first book doesn't sell well. I'm not going to care about book five. I'm barely going to care about book two if book one was a hard sell. Series are sales dependent. You might sign a contract saying, oh, give me a three, you know, this is a two book deal, a three book deal. But if that first book doesn't go, if that first book is a dud out the drawer, it doesn't get anywhere. It doesn't hit the numbers we needed to. It doesn't do stuff. I'm going to, you know, cut you free. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell you to move elsewhere. And the series isn't going to be a series. And that can be a real problem. It can be really, really devastating for people who sort of put a lot of eggs in the basket of I'm a series author. There's nothing wrong with saying it's the first in a series in later query letters and later correspondence in later materials. But in your opening query, you're only ever querying that book. You can say it has series potential, and that's okay, because it does, but I don't need to know you've got these other books prepped that you've been writing for 20 years, and you're just now dusting them off and sending them to me. In fact, when people do that, I generally tend to move faster towards the rejection, because it's not, it shows me, it tells me that they don't understand some part of how the system works. It's one query at a time, one book at a time. It can have series. If I want it to be a series, I will ask you after the first book comes out. And then you get to surprise me and go, yeah, it's totally a series. Here's the next piece. And we can move right along in that production process. But by setting up this expectation of 11 books as a publisher, you're asking me basically to say yes to this and the next books in the series. And if they don't sell well, you've got me on the hook for a big deal. And that's not where I want to be. Moving Moving on before my phone decides to chime in. Um, Luther, Georgia, in the 1970s is a hell of a place to grow up. Time is marked by the growth of kudzu. Cool. Days are spent in lengthy chair rocking sessions. Okay, it's hot and humid and there's no room for music. Well, there's a lot there. It's an okay paragraph, but it's missing stuff. Uh, primarily, it's, it's about a place. There's nothing wrong with talking about a place, but it's not, it's not personalized. Where do you want me to focus? You want me to convey that it's hot and terrible and miserable? Great, you've done that. What else you got? What this second paragraph could be is part of a bigger paragraph, and it could be trimmed down. If you want me to feel a certain way, if you're trying to convey atmosphere, you've done it, good job, but you're going to need to go past that. You're going to need to do more than that. Part of atmosphere is okay. A whole paragraph of atmosphere, a little bit too much, which is the problem that Teddy has. First of all, that's a messy sentence. I don't like the sentence but we've introduced our character because Teddy loves music. 
Also, a terrible sentence. It might be true, the story might be about Teddy loving music, but the two sentences, which the problem Teddy has because Teddy loves music, could be rewritten as one polished sentence. He feels it in his bones, his grandmother says, and that music now has to make its way out in the world. Okay, there's a good idea here, but it's been buried in very clumsy language. One of the big things I spend a lot of time working with on query letters is the language people choose to get their idea across. Yes, it totally makes sense to you. You wrote the book. You understand it. The person reading it, though, hasn't read the book. So you're trying to find the best fit presentation to get the idea across in the way you mean, but in a way that gives it a little bit more formality than however you've personalized it and sort of rounded it off in your head. Because you've been dealing with this forever, right? Weeks, months, years, whatever. So to you, it makes sense to be this sort of amorphous kind of, well, hey, just here, here it is. But we want to dress it up a little bit. We want to make sure it tucks its shirt and we want to make sure the ideas are nicely polished. And, and language is a big part of that. Sentence structure matters. So on the night of the local talent show, Teddy plans to get on stage and show Luther what they don't know, that there's music inside them too. That's a great idea. But the idea of them having music and Teddy loving music and the town having no room for music are three conflicting ideas. They're sort of related in that they include music, the town, and Teddy, but they are not presented in a way that really helps pull everything together. Because basically, is this Footloose, where music is bad and Kevin Bacon has to dance around a barn? Or is this, you know, the talent show where he's going to uplift everybody? Or is this, you know, um, like, a, like a rock song where Teddy's got to go off and be a shooting star and, and, you know, move on about his day? But that's also it. There's no real clear sense of struggle, just that he's got to go do this thing. We don't know how bad it is. We don't know what conflicts ahead of him. We don't know if it's difficult for him. We don't know why he feels driven to do this. It's just presented. He's got to do this. Like, okay, I've, I've got to walk a dog later. Like, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with this? Gorgeous George and the Empire of Stars. Um, there's a question now because we've not mentioned George. We've mentioned a Teddy. And I get that Gorgeous George is a common name. It's a phrase. I get that. And it would need to be better explained. But it's worth pointing out that from a narrative, I'm going to flag this standpoint. I'm going to look at Teddy and George and go, who are we talking about? Is complete. We've already talked about why you don't want to use the word complete in a query. And is in the glam punk genre, but you can put it in Y-A or N-A. Okay. There's a lot wrong in that back part. Primarily, you never want to address you. You're sending the query letter to a person, sure, but you never want to call them you. Not because it's unprofessional. It is. But you never really want to call out the fact that this is an overt business deal. I'm going to talk to you. No, you're just going to talk. The you is implied. But you can put it in YA or NA. No, I want to put it where it goes. So if it's glam punk, first of all, glam punk's not a genre. Uh, it's a genre of music, but it's not a genre of fiction. If you're not sure, don't make up a genre, please. You can just call it punk. Punk is a genre. You could make it up if you're willing to sell it better, if you are willing to say more about it, if you are willing to describe punk using glam adjectives, and then hybridize the word with a portmanteau after the fact, uh, which would be something like is... Um, at 89,000 words, it is the story of rock and roll spandex and glitter, the glamorous, uh, ev the evolution of a glamorous punk and the, uh, the start of the glam punk genre, where I'm taking elements of the story and saying, this book defines this thing I just made up. You could do that if you want, but it's a mouthful. It's a lot of words. Or you could just, you know, more precisely and easily just say it's punk. And don't tell the person reading it where they can stick it. First of all, that's an invitation for a load of problems. But let them, they'll know it's their job. They'll figure out where it should be filed. As the first book in a series, it introduces to the reader of Luther, Georgia, and to Teddy, the protagonist for the first five books in the series. Oh, well, as we already talked about, series are sales dependent. Now, a side note to those people who are doing children's books and illustrated picture books. It is, in those cases, totally normal and totally okay to call out the fact that this is the first book of a series and here is what introduces. 
because the age range of the reader or the fact that, you know, it's going to be read to them, the fact that you're speaking about it structurally, it makes sense to say this book introduces the following things to the reader because it's simple, because it's easy, because it's supposed to. But once we get into fiction, once we get into whether it's adult fiction or, or, or young adult or new adult or anything like that, once we sort of get out of early reader, we don't frame and discuss our books that way anymore. It introduces the world to the reader of Luther, Georgia, and to Teddy. Great. The protagonist for the first five books of the series. No, I want to know about this book one time. One book, one query, just like Fight Club. One book, one query. I don't care. He might be the protagonist for the, first, for the next five books or whatever. Doesn't matter. I'm not there. I'm right here. As he makes his way from unknown to time traveling, glam icon. Yeah, the time traveling thing kind of snuck up out of nowhere, doesn't it? Um, if that's an important story element, and apparently according to this author, it was totally the thing they wanted to talk about. Um, why, in fact, is it buried in the business paragraph? It should have shown up in the body of the text. I can't wait for you to say yes to my book is probably one of the least good endings I've seen for a query. I mean, it makes me laugh. It's funny. I know they wrote this on purpose to like point out, oh my God, this is a terrible query. But you don't want to, like, I get it. Authors are wanting to be published. It's a big deal. It makes them legit. It makes them feel good. It's a dopamine hit. It feels important. It feels, I, I understand all of that. We all know in publishing that authors want to be published. We need authors to be publishers. That's how this business works. Saying yes is what we want to do. We want to say yes to you. We're not looking to gatekeep anymore. Old people, older than me, crustier than me, meaner than me, will still totally gatekeep, but that's a totally different lesson for a totally different day. Don't, don't tell me you want me to say yes. I, I know you do. Thank me for my time and consideration and move on. So that is my example of like bad, bad query. One of the I'm going to stop this. One of the important things here, one of the big deals is that you can always tell when a query is really, really awful, like horrendously bad because it's lacking the fundamental stuff. The trickier part is where it's lacking some or like Brooks, it's got all the right pieces, but the presentation is a little bit off or it's missing this or it needs to be restated that way. It can be a problem like that. And that's where something like what I do comes in. I do query you know, consultations. I'm, I mean, I'm doing 31 this coming week. It's, it's what I do. I do it well. I love doing it. But it's about fundamentally focusing your idea and pairing it together in a way that makes me go, please tell me more. And instead of you saying, yes, I'll be happy to tell you more. All you want to do is hand somebody the manuscript and go, you want more? You got to read my book. That's where we drive from the query. That's what we want to do. That's the important thing. All else can wait. Okay? Now, that all said, you can do this. I don't, I don't know who you are watching this. I don't know when you're watching this. I know this sounds hard. I know you might have been rejected like 400 times, 500 times, 1,000 times, rejected every day for the last 10 years. Uh-huh. I know. But you can do this. It's a skill. You can learn. Learn from your mistakes. Go forward. I know it sucks to get silence as a response. It's terrible. Nobody likes it. But it's part of the business. It just has to happen. You're sending a subjective thing to subjective people and hoping they subjectively like it. Not everybody's going to like everything that happens. Not everybody's going to like everything they, they, they get. You've got to figure that on an average day opening for submissions, a small publisher is going to get anywhere between 30 to 70 submissions a day for whatever their submission windows is. Multiply that by 10 or 15. And when you're starting to get into larger publishers, silence is all right. It's not the end of the world. If you're ever wondering, oh my God, have they not read my thing? Probably no. There's a lot of backlog in the world. Wait patiently. Don't jump on them. Don't demand. It's been 31 days. You said you'd be ready in 30. Hang on there, chief. Take a breath. It's okay. They'll get to you. It's all right. Really, wait. Patience in, in concert with the discipline and organization for writing, that triumvirate is what builds careers. The ability to hurry up and wait. Oh my God, I've written this book. I can't wait to get it done. I got it finished. I got all my plans together. I did all this work. And now I'm going to send it out. 
well, then you got to wait. Uh, uh, how long do I wait? Uh, until it's ready. You did all the work. Now your part's done. Now just hang back and let somebody else do their job. Take your time. Wait patiently. If you get stuck, if you get bored, come talk to me. I'll, occupy, I'll, I'll give you plenty of stuff to talk about if you want to talk about stuff. Just take your time. It's okay. If you get rejected, we can learn from rejection. You can take apart rejection letters. If they're just form rejections, fine. If there are form rejections with notes, great. We can figure out whether or not you want to address those notes and do something about it. Totally okay. If it's silence, fine. Silence is pretty telling. Silence pretty much tells me that the query didn't work and they didn't get to the pages. So what do we do? You write a new query from scratch and you try not to use any, if you can, any of the material from the last query. Now here's where I'm going to say something controversial before I open up for questions. We ready for controversy? This is going to be good. Somebody out there is going to look at this and go, are you serious? And I'm going to say, yeah, I'm totally serious. Every time, I don't care who you're querying it to. Every time, I want you to write a brand new query. Every time to everybody. Yep, I want you to take the time. I don't care. I'm, I'm just going to make this face. It's a parental face. That's how it is. I don't want you to mass mail. I don't want, please don't. Don't email the same query to six people in one email because you think it's easier. I don't want you to copy and paste the same email six different ways. One person, one query from the ground up. Why? Because secretly I don't like you. No, that's not it at all. It's because I want you to get used to telling somebody about your work in loads of different ways. You will get better at this as you go. And as Audrey points out in the chat, yes, every chance you can, it helps you refine and polish and understand a little bit more. Ooh, I could talk about my story this way. Ooh, I could talk about it that way. Ooh, I just thought about this other way I could go. It's always the same story, but you're finding different ways of making it sound appealing because it's subjective. Because we'll never know if the one person you send it to doesn't want it way A or way B. They want it way C. So write way C. You don't know what that's going to be. So you just keep writing. There's a question that usually chases this. Uh, well, how many queries should I send out at a time? And my answer, even to my clients is, uh-huh, you should send queries. Most people are looking for like a magic number. There are no magic numbers. I'm sorry. Believe me. I wish there were. But what you want to do is send out bunches of queries, bunches of queries in numbers that are comfortable for you at the time. Well, it may, may be for you because of how you want to schedule or organize your time, that's 10 queries every two months or six queries a week for eight weeks. You find whatever you like to do and you make it work for you, big or small, whatever. Now, having covered that, one last thing. One of the things that makes me make this face all the time on Twitter is the idea of, and I'm going to now quote people, oh my God, I've emailed like everybody. No, you didn't. You emailed the people you wanted to email and your list was short, so now you're done. You didn't email everybody. You emailed the people you want. You emailed the people you had expectations of. If they all rejected you, which could happen, what are you going to do? You're going to give up? We're not in the quitting business. This is not the quitting class. So, so don't do that. Expand your list. Be willing to go for that B plus agent. Be willing to go for that new agent because I'm going to tell you something. Here's some business. The new agents are hungry and they would be happy to work with a new author and grow the two of your businesses together. Don't, don't write everything off just because you didn't get your A plus first three choices. There's loads of these people in the world. And just because you didn't get any of them doesn't mean you still can't get your story out. It might not be published in the way you mean it to be, but you're, you're always, you're always, there's always options. There's always something you can do. You've just got to be willing to maybe bend some expectation or maybe challenge the way you think things should be done or try something new and scary. Querying for a lot of people is new and scary. And I really and truly hope that over the course of this, however long I've been talking, I've made it just a little less scary for you. I hope. If not, come find me on Twitter 
and and tell me all the ways I'm wrong. I'll happily sit and listen. I have plenty of some, plenty of bottles of water, so let's let's do that sometime. I'm going to unmute because I want some more questions, if any. Or I really just want to hear what that one person's conversation was. It sounded interesting. So you got questions? I want to get you some answers. Hi, John. How's it going? Ah, things are good. How are you? I have absolutely loved this. Thank you so much. I really have. And you did an amazing job of keeping it clean. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to, when this is done, I'm just going to go swear in the other room for like 20 minutes. Yes, absolutely. So, so yeah, I, um, you know, this, I think you've really covered everything we um, can talk about through the, you know, Brooks example and through the, um, the deliberately poor example, uh, I mean, especially I loved how you and how people, you know, say, oh, I've done everything I can. You know, I, I come across this a lot too, where people feel like they've exhausted all options and it's really just the things that they're comfortable with, you know, right, exactly. the things that they really wanted. And, you know, I think part of this process and part of like being a JK Rowling or a Stephen King is that, you know, you really have to go through the gauntlet and you have to be willing to take you know, hundreds of rejections and still keep moving forward and still keep improving your craft or improving your queries. Um, and then, you know, I, I think a lot of people do want that overnight success, but there really is no such thing, I think, of overnight success. And, you know, <laughs> so. I, I used to work with a guy who would tell me that overnight success takes 10 years. Yes, exactly. And I, I used to laugh hysterically at it because I was young and I thought overnight success, I'll be the one who does it different. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it took like 16 years in my case. Yeah. And even then it wasn't really an overnight issue. It was just, it just took a while. Yeah, exactly. I think everyone's journey, you know, it has to be different. So you may not get a hundred rejections like Stephen King. You may get, um, you know, 15 rejections, which are right. still going to be hard, but oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's one of those things. If you, you're investing in yourself every time you um, are willing to put up that part of your soul out there for, for examination. So it's, it's hard. Nobody's saying it's not hard. And it's not like the people on this end of the publishing table think it's easy. We know exactly how crushing it is. And, and there's a lot of, uh, we get a lot of flack in publishing about like, oh, well, you guys are just jerks. You just love sending rejection letters. I used to work with somebody who would cry on rejection letter day. And all she would do is send the form rejection letters, just like the, you know, like this isn't for us, sorry. And then she would just cry in the meetings afterwards Aww. because it is really hard because this is, you know, this is somebody's work, very personal. They've worked for years, months, forever on it and they're being really brave and one of the hardest things that we can't really do in publishing is acknowledge that we don't in our form rejections and we should but we don't we don't have a sentence like thank you so much for being brave enough to send this i really appreciate it because that immediately makes it a personal note which is a different kind of response and that the yeah, way yeah. publishing is all set up it can't just be that simple of being people helping people it's got to be businessy and you know tuck your shirt in and all that stuff mm -hmm. but it's hard. Everybody knows it's hard. The, the goal is to just do your best to make it easier and practice all the skills you need to do and then show up and do it over and over until, until it's easier. It's never totally easy. It's never one of those things like, oh, I'll write a query. I'll be done in five minutes. Here you go. I'm done. Publish me. Let's go. It takes time. I mean, I've worked with people for 20 years and they're just now like, getting bestseller status or selling this many copies or doing this, that, or the other thing. And it's really gratifying to see because I remember like, oh man, I used to sit on that guy's porch and we would complain like, I don't know how we're going to get through chapter six, man. And here <laughs> we are like, oh, that book just got, you know, another star from this review or this thing. Yeah. And it, you take time and you're, you've got to, you've got to know first and foremost, no matter what you're doing, you're worth it because the writing was hard and the querying is a different hard animal that you can equally tame. It's a different set of skills, but it's still a critical set of skills. Yeah. You don't want to farm out querying to other people. It's tempting. Oh, it's I love really that. Tempting. You, you feel that way because I think that's, that's the way it is with a lot of things. If you don't know how to do it, you can't identify if something's wrong with it. Exactly. And if, if you said, hey, John, I want you to write me a query letter, I am happy to take your money and write you a query letter, but I don't know your book as well as you do. And yeah, sure, I can sit and talk to Brooke about like, hey, in your story with your query letter in front of you, 
what about this and what about that? That makes sense. But if I don't have a, you know, pre-created query letter in front of me and I just got to make one up on the fly, I would not have known that Brooke was aiming her story in that way. You don't want to farm out these vital parts of publication. Yeah, there's plenty of stuff you can farm out. You don't want to make a cover, get a cover guy. You don't want to do, you know, you don't want to write a back blurb, fine. Let's go find a guy who can write you a back blurb. But don't farm out querying. Don't don't give up the opportunity to be enthusiastic about your work. It yeah, never, so ever goes well. Too. Hey, it's yours. Own it. If it, you know, when the... The other note I want to make now that I'm thinking about it is when you're rejected, what's being rejected is the query letter. Not you, not your work, not how hard you work, not how much you love reading, not the every Tuesday for the last six years, you got it before o'clock in the morning. None of that's getting rejected. The query is getting rejected. If the query letter was okay and it got them to read the pages and the pages are the thing that made the rejection, then the pages are the thing that you need to go work on. But you're not going to know that unless the response you get is something more than a form rejection letter. But you're, the thing never getting rejected is you. And we as creatives do way too much self-rejecting. Oh, they're not going to like this. Oh, this is awful. This is terrible. I bet this is all. Yeah, this is terrible. I really want to swear, man. Like, you know, I think too many people self-reject before they give themselves a chance. And that's, that's a hard lesson. I think writing query says, yeah, it absolutely. Um, you you have to you've got to hone it in because everybody can you know shotgun blast like a million things. It could be about this, and it could be about that. Much like everything else in the world, you got to make choices and stick with it. That's that's the yeah. I unmuted you, Brooke. Sorry. Um, feel free to just <laughs> okay. jump right on in. Um, but yeah, the one thing if if I if I ever find like the genie in a bottle magic wand kind of a thing, and I believe me, I'm looking. Like my house is really clean right now. I'm looking. The the thing I would want first of all is to eliminate a lot of the self rejection, because I think that dooms a lot of good effort before it even gets going, and a lot of the doubt in querying comes from well, I don't know if I should say that because what if they don't like it? Try it. Just like a little kid in vegetables, man. Try it you might actually really come to like it unless it's broccoli. And I get it. My, my eight year old does not do broccoli and would never do broccoli no matter how you offer it. But this is not broccoli. This is a query. This is about you being excited about your thing. And you are absolutely 1000% allowed to be excited about something you worked super hard on. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I like what Brooke mentioned about writing the queries, but I, I really just want to harp on that one more time, how awesome I think that is, because I think every time we look at something we wrote, we can find ways to improve it, to make it more concise or to give it more punch. And if we're just, and I've never heard anyone say that before to keep re rewriting your query. So I think that's fantastic that you did it. Um, because it's not like you're rewriting your book 80 times. You're rewriting a query letter, which yeah. is you know, what three or four paragraphs. You yeah. know? Um, and I think there's just so much room, you know, you can find so much room for improvement and you know, how many times does it take to get to the point where you say, I just don't know what to change anymore. <laughs> and that's fine too. If you get to that point where, I mean, people ask me this all the time, like, well, how do I know when I'm done writing my book? When the changes you make are more cosmetic than substantial. When you're questioning, well, if I make this character an inch taller, does it change anything? No. And if you get to a query and you're like, well, what adjective can I use instead of short? It, that, it's not that big a deal. I mean, it's important by all means. You could go, go crazy trying to find an adjective you like. But when that's the level of change you're at, go send the query out. Go find it. And then go write a totally different query. One of the things people run into is they, they, they latch on the key phrases. I love writing this sentence. I love this phrase. I put it in all my queries. And that's okay. I mean, I use the word so. If you ever read any of my blog posts, I got like two billion so's. I can't help it. I've tried. I'm working hard enough it is not to swear. Like I'm working on it. <laughs> but the crutches in querying and the crutches in text are possibly one of the easiest thing to fix once you get them pointed out to you. You might not realize in your last six queries that you kept using the phrase, you know, unsolicited attention or um, underachiever 
And then you go on to talk about how the character is an overachiever. When you get those things pointed out, it's one of those things like, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. And then all of a sudden the door is wide open. Well, what do I want to do to different? You can do a million things differently. And that's, that's the fun in querying for me. Yeah, tell me, absolutely. Tell me something exciting about your book. Go. Oh, I didn't think about that. That's <laughs> nice. And then, you, then, then let's go write that down and then let's go do another. Tell me another thing. Okay, what about this? How do we get these pieces to come together? It's, it's not, I never think of it as a chore unless I'm talking to somebody who looks at it like it's this impossible thing. They've got to earn somebody's approval. A query letter is not about earning somebody's approval. It's about being excited. Approval is over there. Approval is the consequence of good action. So you've got to approve first before you can get it out the door. So just be excited and write something down. A bad query will teach you 10 times as much as a good query. A good query will still teach you a lot, but fail a lot and you'll figure out what works. You just got to sit down and ask questions about it. I love that. Especially, um, you know, where do you think people can first turn when they're looking for a second set of eyes? Oh, well, there's a couple different ways I can answer this question. Um, I think first and foremost, you want to go to people who are aware that you're querying. Like you can't, don't, don't go to your, I mean, nothing, not, not that you want to not go to your spouse, but if your spouse is not a writer yeah. and they're going to, they're going to give you a pretty biased opinion, like, oh honey, it's fine. Um, or no, this is fine. Really? You're doing okay. Just maybe try this. And it's a very tepid thing because they don't want to hurt your feelings. So the first place I would go is I would go look for people who are also querying or people who have queried successfully. Yes. And the scary thing is asking them, Hey, could you take a look at this? Because it's, it's a, it can be perceived as a big ask, but you're not asking for like, fix my thing. Other person you're asking like, can you help me just, just be a person for a minute and spot check me. I think you want to start with the people around you. You want to look at your, your writing circle. You want to look at a Facebook group like this. You want to look at critique partners. So long as they are also querying, don't just like, you know, the random lady who's been writing that book for 11 years, but never got past chapter 12. She's maybe not your best resource, yeah. but you want, you want to find people who have been or are at the same place you are. Mm. I, after that, yes, absolutely go on the internet. The problem with the internet, aside from it being the internet, is that a lot of people will drive you to one specific place. Go here for query advice. And I, I, I'm a big, I don't know if I'm allowed to, can I, can I name check them? Oh, let's keep it clean that way too, just in case. That's fine. No, that's totally fine. So they will often reference one specific website to go to. Go to this person for query advice. They have a lot and they do have a lot. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have no problem with that person. I have no problem with their advice except when you go through all their advice over and over, it starts churning out formulaic queries and everything. You can start to spot, oh, you've been to that website, haven't you? You've read this blog post and this blog post because I'm starting to see the pattern. And there's no pattern for a good query. Yeah. So the internet can be a place to give you some roadmaps, mm -hmm. some loose ideas. Okay, I know not to do X, Y, and Z, and I kind of know it should look like this, but what else? Other than that, go find a coach, go find a writing group, go find a Facebook group, go find somebody who you've never talked to, who doesn't have, you know, who's not your spouse, who isn't going to go, you know, honey, it's fine. Come find somebody like me who I don't know, Brooke. This is the first time I've ever spoken to Brooke. That wasn't the voice I thought Brooke would have come out of her face. And <laughs> there I am talking to Brooke and Brooke God could, you know, I, somebody who doesn't know you, who doesn't carry the same assumptions and bias and pre-knowledge makes a difference. That's who I would talk to. Past that, uh, I just write more queries. I would write more queries until you could wallpaper a house, man. Like go to town, write a query, write a different query, try to come at it from a different angle. So long as you get the title, the word count, the genre, you spell your own name correctly, you say something about you and you talk about conflict and tension or plot or character or something interesting, you're, you'll, you'll find your own way. Every story is different, every query is different. You just hash it out there. Uh, I started doing queries specifically. I started with queries like five years ago and I just used to do queries. I used to do queries and resumes and nobody liked the resumes because they were really boring and I hated doing them. They put me to sleep and the query was never enough because I'd want to like go, look, let's go look at your pages. And then I started, I grew the business that way. But 
yeah, you got to ask for help. At some point, you got to go to people you don't know and ask them for opinions. And you might not like what we say. Like Brooke might go home and sit there and, and read her stuff and go, who is that guy? Tell me that about my book. And I'll tell you who I am. Like, I'll, I'll just go, hi, I'm me. This is my experience. This is what I've done. And Brooke might go, this is awful. I'm not doing it. And that's up to Brooke. And if she wants to take it and go in a different direction, I want her to. Personally, I do want her to try my version. I think it's pretty good. But if, if that doesn't float Brooke's boat, I, I can't make Brooke do it. Yeah. Querying is a personal process. And it's one of those things that helps define voice. Mm. Because voice is bigger than book. Absolutely. I love it. Thank you so much, John. Uh, does oh, anyone else have any questions really quick? If you don't have questions now, please come find me online. Find me on Facebook. Find me on Twitter. You can always find me on Twitter. Find me somewhere and just ask. You're not going to bother me. My entire job is built around answering people's questions or giving presentations like this or just talking to people all day. I'm more than happy to do it. You're not going to bother me. You're not going to upset me. You're not going to ask a stupid question that I've answered 11 times. Who cares if I've answered it 11 times? It's the first time I've answered it for you. I'm always happy to help somebody. Yay. Thank you. I know we'll definitely have some more takers when people get to watch the replay. So I'm Sweet. excited to see um, where it all goes next. Yes. And if you have any, um, you know, any special things going on about queries, um, we'll post that in Sprints and Spirits and ATA and make sure. I do. Know. I have a coupon code for you guys. Oh, awesome. Because coupons are fun. Yes, they um, are. Yeah, it'll take, I want to say it's 20% off an hour with me for queries. Awesome. I think it's 20. I'll confirm that and make sure it goes in the group correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely post that. Let us know because I know there's a lot of people who weren't able to attend today who could use some personalized help with their queries. So we'll definitely get it posted. All right, guys, thank you so much for showing up today. I really hope you loved this. Um, please reach out to John if you need any help with your queries. Um, Reach out to me with any other presentations or experts you'd like to see because I love bringing people together. So anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful Saturday. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.